Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and I don't know about you, but I am terrible and goodbyes, especially when I have to say goodbye to someone I truly admire and have grown to love. But such is life, and all of American Jewry is going to have to say goodbye to a great, great man who served the State of Israel with extraordinary distinction, has become beloved and respected and admired throughout the American Jewish community as passionate Jew, as an Ohev Yisrael, a lover of both the state of Israel and the people of Israel, who has the ability to discuss complex and sensitive issues challenging Israel and Jewish life in America, anti-Semitism, BDS, the relationship between disaffected young Americans and the state of Israel. He discusses all the issues with nuance and sensitivity and with a lovely sense of humor that has endeared him to Jewish audiences throughout the tri-state New York Jewish community and the Jewish communities across the country. I'm speaking, of course, about the Honorable Danny Dayan, who is concluding four years of service as Consul General of the Israeli Consulate in New York. If you've seen Danny Dayan on JBS, and he's one of the hardest working Consul Generals we've ever had on Second Avenue, he is ubiquitous. There doesn't seem to be a Jewish event Danny is not at. He even sings beautifully, I might add. You might have seen that on JBS. And he's become for me, as he has for Jew virtually every American Jew who knows him, a dear friend who always makes me feel special when he sees me. I love him very much. And while I'm happy he's moving on to new opportunities, I will miss him. I will miss you, Din and Dion, very, very much. So thank you for making sure you and I have one more chance to share a moment on JBS before your term as Consul General here in New York concludes. Welcome again to L'Chaim and JBS, Danny. Thank you so much, Rabbi Golub. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. By the way, Danny, I began doing L'Chaim way back in 1979. And through L'Chaim, I have known virtually every Consul General many of, America, of Israel's UN ambassadors, including Benjamin Netanyahu when he was representing Israel at the United Nations. But Danny, I go back to Paul Kedar of blessed memory, a lovely, lovely, also deeply committed Jew, proud Israeli. And Paul was very good to me as a young kid, starting out with radio, a radio show called L'Chaim. And I remember something Paul once told me, Danny. He said, from his perspective, there should never be a public Jewish event in America without its having the flag of Israel and without its singing Hatikvah. And that had an enormous impact on me, not simply as the host of L'Chaim, but as a young rabbi starting out. You have any reaction to Paul Kedard's words in this regard? Yes, I think that um, <clears throat> Paul Kedar's words uh, are today implemented uh, almost in every shul, in every reform, conservative, modern Orthodox shul in America. I saw two flags, the flag of uh, the US and the flag of Israel. And uh, I didn't think, as maybe Paul did, that that's obvious. I think that it represents a lot. It encapsulates the bond. Um, but it's, you know, something interesting. It's not only in Jewish events. 
is also in non-Jewish events, or I would say events organized by non-Jews in which uh, Jews participate. For instance, I remember being in a pre-Seder Pesach, uh, a kind of Seder Pesach before Pesach organized by the FDNY commissioner. And uh, there was also there an Israeli flag. It wasn't an Israeli event. It was not even an, an event organized by a Jewish organization. It was organized by the fire department of New York City. And nevertheless, there was a, a, an Israeli flag. But you know what, uh, probably uh, the, the strongest memory that your question uh, uh, raises for me is uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, Shabbat, exactly one week after the terrible shooting. The following Shabbat, the shooting was obviously also during the Shabbat, so exactly one week later, virtually the whole community is uh, davening in Rodev Shalom Synagogue, a, a long service, a very long service intertwined with speeches, and it ends, and there is one anthem, Tatikva. For me, and it came really, you know, from the bottom of the hearts of, uh, of the more than 1,000 uh, Jews present there, in one of the most painful and significant moments you can't imagine. For me, that uh, said that uh, all the, the rumors about the demise of the, the special relationship between Israel and uh, an American jury were uh, Exact, highly exaggerated and premature. That is a wonderful story. All right, so Danny, what I really want to talk to you about is what you've come to understand about American Jewry. And again, you know, you've, you've alluded to it already. On the one hand, so many American Jews feel passionately for the state of Israel. And then on the other hand, there are some American Jews, young and old, who seem to be disconnected from Israel, even alienated from Israel. And I know that as the Israeli Consul General, you must be diplomatic in your statements about American Jewry. So uh, I'm not interested here in putting you on the spot. I just want to know the extent to which you can. I want to hear really what you feel the strengths and weaknesses are of the American Jewish community in terms of its commitment to the state of Israel and in terms of its Jewish identity. So, and I want to step back one half step. And you and I have, first of all, you and I have met many, many times. You did a wonderful L'chaim with me talking about your own personal life. But I want you to just remind our audience you came to, to the United States as Consul General four years ago. When you came to America, how well did you know American Jewry? Um, not well enough. Uh, you know, uh, I uh, have visited uh, New York uh, and America even more, but New York City, I don't know, I stopped counting at, uh, at some stage, but I assume that 20 or 30 times. Uh, by the way, my first visit to New York City was exactly 1979, the year that you started the broadcast. <laughs> and by the way, we should remind people, you were born in Argentina? That's right. And you go to Israel when you're how old? When I was a teenager, I was 15. Okay. And, and by the way, in terms of your own personal identity, Danny, growing, you're, you're born in Argentina, you spend a good part of your early life there. You're moving in the middle of high school, in essence, to yeah, Israel. It's, it's not the recommended age to, <laughs> to move from one society to other, but... Uh, I want to know, in terms of your own self-identity, do you, con you continue to consider yourself... I'm an Argentinian who made no, no, who went to no. Israel and then to America. No, I am an Israeli that was born in Argentina. No, no, no I am a Jew that uh, is an Israeli that was born in Argentina, but no more than that. 
But okay. you know, uh, it's related to your question, Mark, because uh, you asked, uh, what did I know about the American? How familiar I was with the American Jewish society and uh, community, and I can't say that I knew enough. Uh, I had a feeling, but uh, I wouldn't say that it was knowledge. But the interesting thing is that after being here a few weeks, I would say, I felt a sense of deja vu. And I asked myself, why deja vu? I never lived, I, I, I have been here many times, but that, it wasn't the kind of deja vu of walking the Fifth Avenue or Times Square. It was something different. And I, I, it was difficult to me to understand that feeling, what exactly, pinpoint what exactly that feeling is. And uh, suddenly I understood that it's about my childhood in Argentina. I mean, it was a deja vu of uh, meeting a Jewish community outside of Israel. Uh, a thing that uh, for 50 years I uh, forgot uh, what exactly it means or how it feels. And suddenly I felt it again. And I felt uh, very connected. Uh, I felt very belonging. I felt very connected. And probably that's the reason that um, I felt so comfortable with uh, with the American Jewish community, that in some sense is a different community from the Argentina, a different period, but essentially are the same. Two very uh, committed Jewish communities out and very Zionist Jewish communities outside of the state of Israel. Fascinating. And you're talking about really diaspora Jewry. And I want you to develop that point for one moment. You were born in diaspora Jewry, you spend a good part of your life in Israel, and then here you are serving in another diaspora community. Obviously, it is now seen as the second most important Jewish community. For a long time, America was the uh, most important Jewish community. Now Israel is the most important Jewish community, and America is the second most important. I agree Okay. that definition. But, you know, what is it, what do you think American Jews don't understand, Danny, about what it means to live in the diaspora. Because very often when you're in the middle of something, you're not able to appreciate both the difficulties, the nuances. So, but for yeah. Danny Dayan, what's it mean as you experience once again living in diaspora? And what's it tell you as an Israeli? No, Mark, uh, uh, first of all, we have to understand and, 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 and come to terms with the fact that we are different. American Jews and Israeli Jews are in many senses different. So also as a community, we grew up, we developed our characteristics with different, uh, I would say, survival strategies. Israeli Jews had to build a Jewish state had to build a Jewish society for the first time, an independent Jewish society for the first time after, after 2000 years. American Jewry had to blend, had to uh, uh, blend in, a, in an existing community, a, an existing society, and to be accepted. Uh, those are, you, you, it's not the coincidence yet you develop complete, very different characteristics. Um, I would say that for Israeli Jews, the most important Jewish value, if I have to pinpoint what to choose one, is the uh, Shivat Zion, the return to Zion. Uh, while for the American Jewry, the most important Jewish value is probably Tikkun Olam, uh, improving the world. And uh, the challenge that we face, and it's uh, quite a daunting challenge, is uh, to recognize that uh, those differences and uh, nevertheless, uh, to let the commonalities, to let the things in which that we share uh, be prevalent over the difference and maintain the, 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 the fraternal bonds. Uh, it's not always an easy task. It explains uh, some of the frictions that we witness, but it's imperative. It's imperative that we do that effort. Now, one more word. Um, American Jews know a lot about the issues that Israel faces. The issue knows not a lot about what happens in Israel, what are the challenges that Israel is facing, etc., etc. I 
sometimes believe that American Jews know but don't understand the way Israelis make their decisions. Um, they uh, don't understand the, the, the feelings, the, the, the perceptions, uh, the fears, and the hopes that Israelis have. And for that reason, sometimes they are uh, surprised by uh, the decisions that uh, Israelis or majority of Israelis make. I would uh, pu put it in, a, in my last days as a diplomat so I can say it more freely that uh, probably a year ago I wouldn't say that. I would recommend American Jews um, instead of inviting five times as keynote speaker, uh, Tsipi Livni, and sometimes balancing her with uh, Michael Oren, both of them my friends and persons that I great respect for, uh, to invite uh, Israeli leaders from different uh, sectors of Israeli communities, Israeli society, Haredim, uh, uh, Mizrahim, um, and uh, settlers, uh, Arab Israelis, and uh, to better understand the complexity of Israeli society and the kind of trade-off that Israelis do with each other uh, uh, when they have to uh, make decisions. You know, it's interesting. You said so many things that make me think about who American Jews are, our own self-identity and our connection to Israel. And in no particular order, you may be right, but it makes me very uncomfortable. I hope you're wrong when you say that while Israelis have this preoccupation with basically rebuilding the Jewish homeland and the Jewish state, that what American Jews are con concentrating on is tikkun olam. And you should know, Danny, here on JBS, I rail against the phrase tikkun olam. I think it really is a misstatement of Jewish tradition. The rabbis never use the term tikkun olam. You won't find it in the Talmud. It's basically a term out of Kabbalah. It was created as a way of trying to galvanize what, when I was a kid, was called social action. And therefore, tikkun olam has become a phrase that has more to do with how do Jews deal with the global issues. And you and I understand to be a Jew is to be concerned with the world and to certainly be concerned with justice in the world. But the Jewish tradition never taught the world was in some way broken and had to be repaired. That's a Christian notion. The rabbi's idea is always that the Jewish world, the world must be improved, but it starts from very good and is moving towards Mitsuyan or a messianic end. But Tikkun Olam has become the phrase that means social action, not necessarily a concern specifically with Jewish needs and with Jewish self-concern. And um, I want you to speak about the extent to which you feel American Jewry is not yet, or has lost, maybe a better way to say it, has lost a sense of focus that as important as every other community is, as important as it is to be sensitive to the pain of other peoples. A Jew's first responsibility, by the way, it's the responsibility of a person <clears> of <throat> family. Our first responsibility is to care for our own family. In this case, it's the Jewish people in general, and it is the people of Israel. The state of Israel, Danny, is not an idea. It's a reality of human beings trying to create, once again, a Jewish society in a Jewish homeland. It's about people. It's about roughly 6 million Jews are now in Israel. 
And it sometimes pains me that American Jewry is more concerned about the general universal ethical demands of life and are not as concerned as Israelis are with the particular Jewish family. Now, again, you're a diplomat, that's but I've that's... expressed to you my feelings and I wanna know if you share any of it. You know, that's exactly what I intended to say. I, I, I also had a, a, a somewhat similar question from <clears throat> a journalist the other day, and I told him that uh, Israeli diplomats are not allowed to moonlight as the sociolo sociologists of the Jewish community. Um, but uh, I will say this, nevertheless. I um, ask myself frequently, what are the special obligations, the special duties of, to use a, a Hebrew word, the special mitzvot of our Jewish generation? Do we have something that is special to our contemporary generation? For instance, there was a generation, a Jewish generation, both in Eretz Israel and the United States that had a very clear extra mitzvah, extra duty, and it was to try to save the European Jewry from extermination. Unfortunately, that generation failed. I'm not judging, probably it was impossible to succeed. I'm just describing, they failed. Then came a Jewish generation, uh, both in America and in Israel, that had the extra mitzvah, the extra duty to try to liberate the, the Soviet Jewry, to bring home the Ethiopian Jewry. Thank God they succeeded uh, very well. What about us? It's not clear. We don't have a, a mission, a duty, a mitzvah that's so clear like those two. Uh, BDS for sure is not that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it will be even insulting to compare BDS to those two things. So I think that we have basically today two extra obligations, two extra mitzvot as Jews in, in 2020. The first one is uh, to secure the existence of the State of Israel, not just the existence, uh, the existence as a robust, thriving, uh, successful community could stay. The second is to guarantee a continuity of Jewish life elsewhere, in all the places in which, in which Jews reside. I am a staunch Zionist. I would like every Jew to be in Eretz Israel, but I am also a realist, and I know it's not going to happen in the immediate future. So in that case, we have to guarantee the, exist, the, 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 the continuity of Jewish life. The problem, the, the tragedy will be if each one of the two large Jewish communities, Israel and America, sees themselves uh, uh, as uh, uh, responsible for only one of them, those needs. But Israelis will say, look, we work hard to guarantee Israel's existence, success, uh, uh, um, and uh, robustness. Uh, that's enough. We don't have to, to work to guarantee. We are not uh, Shomer Achi. We are, I'm not the guardian of my brother. The, and American Jews will say we have daunting challenges here, especially in the, the post-COVID-19 era. Uh, we have to uh, uh, take care of ourselves and Israel will take care of it. That will be a tragedy uh, because that means that we will cease to be one people. We need here cross responsibility. I know that cross is not the most Jewish word, but we need cross responsibility. Every single Jew, and for sure every single Jewish community of those two has to see uh, itself as responsible for both simultaneously. And I will tell you something more, Mark. Uh, um, with all due respect to journalism, I am not so worried what will be the headline tomorrow in JBS, or what will be he the headline tomorrow in Yediot Achronot regarding the relationship between Israel and the diaspora. Uh, the Kotel, I, I, all those are very important things, but they are transient, they are temporal. My fear, what sometimes lives literally sleepless at night, is the the, 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 the thought, what will be written in the Jewish history book that will be written 
100 years from now, in 2120. And I hope, and we have to work that hard in order to prevent that. I hope that it will not be read, we will not read there that during the 21st century, basically the Jewish people uh, uh, split into two disconnected uh, uh, groups, the Jews of Israel, the Jews of America, or even worse, uh, that uh, one of the Jewish groups uh, we lost, uh, uh, one of those tribes. So that's the basic, that's I think the, 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 the important mission of our generation. Israel, Jewish life, and the connection between them. Lovely. Look, I can't have you on the Chaim right now while everybody's talking about this piece Peter Beiner wrote. And it's not about Peter Beiner, it's about the philosophical issue he raises. And again, Peter Beiner published a piece in Jewish Currents, which was excerpted in the New York Times. He has been a long time advocate of a two state solution. He is probably a leading voice on the American Jewish left. And he says he no longer supports a two-state solution. And not only that, he understands that by supporting, in essence, the one-state solution, what he calls Israel-Palestine, that there will no longer be a Jewish state, only a Jewish homeland. And at the moment, that piece is getting a lot of attention because Peter Beiner, again, is a very high profile um, Jewish intellectual, liberal, um, and someone associated with J Street. But I do want your reaction, not to Peter personally necessarily, but the extent to which there is a move on the Jewish left that is that seeks to undercut the statehood of Israel. And this is what has been always a fear, Danny, among those who have been critical of the Jewish left. The fear is that they really want an end to the state of Israel and believe that it is necessary for this cause of greater justice, tikkun olam, as you describe, that some accommodation is made for the Palestinian that eliminates the the polity of the Jewish people, even if they remain in the land of Eretz Yisrael and have some kind of presence there in a homeland there. But Peter's peace has raised a lot of issues, and I want to know the extent to which you're comfortable no, giving no your reaction. I am very comfortable because it's about Israel. It's not only about the American Jews. Um, basically, what uh, uh, Peter Beinart says to Israel is drop dead. And our answer is uh, no, thank you, forget about it. Uh, but uh, uh, the attempt to portray it as a Zionist, uh, uh, as inside the frame of Zionism, is absurd. It's a preposterous. I, uh, I met Mr. Beinart uh, uh, at his request uh, not long ago. I uh, told him that um, I see his trajectory. Uh, he is obviously uh, living the Zionist tent. And uh, okay, that's his right uh, to do it. But the attempt to portray his last uh, 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 piece as within the framework of the Zionist discussion is really outrageous, is preposterous. Uh, I have also, uh, I was not very impressed by the intellectuality of the piece. Uh, uh, basically, uh, he presents a progressive, uh, progressive as, as, as trailblazing ideas that were mulled in the 1920s, abandoned in the 1930s, and dragged into the 1940s only by one uh, organization the PKP, which was the Soviet-controlled uh, Communist Party of that time in, in Eretz Israel. So uh, it's hardly to call it progressive or trade place. But I will tell you something uh, uh, probably more, more, more significant. Look, Mark, um, we are a, one people, Jews are one people, 
because basically you take out Jewish solidarity and there is no Jewish people. Uh, if we take the basic precept of Kol Israel Arevim Zebazeh, you take that out of Judaism, you are left okay with a set of uh, rituals and uh, common history, but you are not a people anymore. Um, and uh, what bothers me uh, in uh, some wings of uh, American Jewry is that um, I think that those that advocate for sure the dismantlement, the dismantlement of Israel, that Mr. Beiner does, but not only that, those that uh, advocate boycotting Israel, and those that advocate uh, cutting uh, security defense aid to Israel by the United States, they basically cut the, 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 the take the Jewish solidarity issue outside of the, the of Jewish peoplehood. Because if you, I can have a lot of uh, uh, arguments with my brother, but if I speak talking with him, I speak visiting his home, we are not brothers anymore. I can have a lot of uh, arguments with uh, uh, Jewish com between Jewish community and Israel. But the moment uh, a Jewish leader, even more so a spiritual leader, a rabbi, petitions the American government to le give less money to Israel to defend the life of Jews, to defend the life of Jews. Imagine if we would say, uh, give less money to protect Schulz in New York. We are not Jews anymore. I mean, that's that's outrageous too. That that that's the the base, the most basic level of solidarity that uh, that one nation has. So that's what worries me. The, the the crossing of that those lines, not political lines, lines of Jewish solidarity, and with that is very difficult for me to 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 accept. There are those um, in the American Jewish community. Danny, and you've met them, who are honestly committed to the state of Israel. They want <laughs> Israel to thrive and be The majority. Safe. Okay. And yet they have been moved by the claim that Israel has been unjust to the Palestinian. More specifically, there are those on the Israeli scene as well as the American Jewish scene. And I'm now talking about somebody like Yossi Klein Halevi, who writes a book about letters to and from his Palestinian neighbor. And what he basically says is, there are two, this is his word now, narratives. The word narrative is very fashionable today. It's not about truth versus fiction. It's about you have your narrative, the Jew has his narrative, the Palestinian has his narrative. And to be an understanding person, you must respect the Palestinian narrative. And by the way, I want everybody to understand, I respect the Palestinian's right to have any narrative he or she wants. But there is history. And history is not a narrative. And my own sense is that the, there is a history that took place First of all, it begins in the Davidic Solomonic period, even before, and runs up to the present time. And there certainly is modern Jewish history beginning at the end of the 19th century, leading into 20th century Zionism. But there are those who argue that the Palestinian narrative has just as much of a claim as the Jewish narrative has, and therefore, when the Palestinian says, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, and feels that Palestine is his country, just as Jews feel it is our country, when we talk about our tie to Jerusalem, the Muslim has his tie to Jerusalem, and the Muslim has as much of a narrative for Jerusalem as the Jew does, it begins to undercut any sense, in my view, of what honest history is. I know you've heard this before, 
but I want to understand how you respond to the claim that the American Jew must be sensitive to both the Jewish narrative and the Palestinian narrative. Well, you know, Mark, uh, probably I'll surprise you. I will surprise you in this point. Uh, I uh, quite agree with you, see, Klein Alevi. Um, uh, I obviously th believe that only one of those narratives is true. The Jewish one, the Zionist one. Uh, I, we know for sure as a fact uh, that we uh, were forcibly expelled by an empire uh, from our homeland and we, for one single day, we, we didn't cease to, to yearn to return uh, to our homeland in a unique case in history. I don't think there is any other nation in history that uh, the groom before kissing the bride said, uh, for 2000 years, if I forget the Jerusalem or, or things like that. But, uh, and therefore, uh, 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 the moment we, we could return, the moment the uh, gigantic statesman, Benjamin Zev Herzl, Theodor Herzl, made, converted that yearning into a political movement, into a practical movement, we returned to, uh, to, to exercise our, our right. But I don't uh, uh, underestimate the fact that the Palestinians uh, feel differently. Um, but here lies the crux of the conflict and why it, at right now, is impossible to solve it. Because uh, most Israelis, uh, and that includes uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and uh, yes, it also includes me, um, understand that the history created a peculiar situation in which uh, Jews returned to their homeland, to their to the homeland they are indigenous to, and they found also another ethnic group uh, there that feels that they are indigenous. The Palestinians, on the other hand, and this is the real problem what we, why we can't solve the conflict. The Palestinians see it uh, differently. They see themselves as the only indigenous people of the land and see us absurdly, but I think sincerely, genuinely, they see, this, they see the Jews returning to Zion as colonialists. Now, you don't uh, uh, compromise with the colonialists, and that's the reason they uh, uh, rejected uh, every compromise, and we accepted every compromise. So, you know, there is a perception, Mark, that in order to solve the conflict, we have to bridge the gaps in the so-called core issues of the conflict. Borders, Jerusalem, security, settlements, refugees, and probably water or, or something else. And the moment we will bridge the gaps in each one of those core issues, we will solve the conflict. Wrong, those are technicalities. In order to start the peace process, to start the peace process, the Palestinians should understand that we are indigenous that Jews are indigenous. As long as they see us as usurpers, as colonialists, the most they will do is a ceasefire, an armistice, until we are weak. But the tragedy is that they are doing exactly the opposite. They are going in this exact opposite direction. I remember, you know, it happened to me here, in, it happened to me in Manhattan. I was at Parky Synagogue. It was an um, international Holocaust Memorial Day event. The keynote speaker was Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. And Guterres says in a non-political speech, he says that the temple that was destroyed in Jerusalem in the year 70 was a Jewish, a Jewish temple. Nothing more than that, no political conclusions. The following day, the Palestinian envoy to the UN presents a protest and he demands, he retracts his words and says this is an affront to the Palestinian people. If you continue to behave that way, continue to educate your youth that way, that, falla that, 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 that fallacy, that uh, 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 trans, you know, 
travesty of history, uh, uh, then they will never compromise and we will never be able to bridge those gaps that I referred to. That's the reason I always say, Mark, that the most important person in the peace process is not, with all due respect, the President of the United States or the Secretary General of the UN, not the Prime Minister of Israel, not even the President of the Palestinian Authority. The most important person in the peace process is the Minister of Education of the Palestinian Authority. And the moment they will start to educate that we Jews be also belong, that day will start the peace process. And people ask me, how do will you know that they believe that you belong? My answer is very simple. When you see it, you know it. When we, we Israelis will feel that the Palestinian accept us as legitimate, as indigenous, we will know it. And I will tell you one last word. The moment that happens, probably I will not like it, but Israelis will become so forthcoming in a negotiation. They will be ready to make so much concessions if the moment they feel we are accepted, probably too much concessions, that, uh, you, that, that will shock you. So that's the core of the conflict. And as long as the Palestinians not only don't come to terms with our belonging, but exactly make the opposite way, I'm not optimistic about uh, uh, finding a solution to the conflict. Well, you are so wise. It is so wonderful to learn from you. I have one question about your advice for American Jewry when it comes to what is presented as the most volatile issue separating religion, the, you know, the Jewish communities of reform and conservative non-Orthodox communities in the state of Israel. And that has to do with the ways in which non-Orthodox Jews in America see Orthodox establishments in control of the Jewish life of the state of Israel. And it goes to the Western Wall. It goes to the fact that there's no funding of um, non-Orthodox synagogues in Israel and non-Orthodox rabbis in Israel. There's an extent to which people feel within the Reform Movement, the Conservative Movement, the Reconstructionist Movement, that in some way Israel, Israel is making them second-class citizens. And that therefore we're told there are American Jews who are part of these movements who feel as if Israel is not saying to them, you belong here too. What's your words to Amer any American Jew who feels that the issue of Jewish pluralism or lack of Jewish pluralism in the state of Israel should be a wedge between American Jewry and the state of Israel? I, I would say that uh, let's uh, differentiate uh, between the cause and the reaction. Uh, I was a great, I am a, a great advocate for uh, religious pluralism in Israel. I uh, say, and Laura, I even said that as an Israeli diplomat, uh, uh, I think that uh, we have to do much better. Uh, I uh, was an advocate, even as an Israeli diplomat, uh, for more religious pluralism in Israel, even causing sometimes uh, friction between me and uh, the government. Um, uh, that uh, when I, when I refer to American Jews, need, the need to bring here and listen to Israeli public figures that uh, are not uh, a copy paste of American Jews, but are different, uh, uh, that's part of uh, the thing. They should uh, 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 at least to understand uh, uh, Israeli's, Israeli decisions, we, they have to engage Haredi Manat. And I will tell you, um, I saw myself from day one as uh, uh, in all things that regard the Jews, not on, on general things. I saw myself, I, I said it explicitly, 
uh, as a bi-directional envoy, as a bi-directional ambassador and uh, an envoy of Israel to the American Jewry, but also uh, a, 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 an envoy of the American jury to the Israeli government and public, and I, I think that I acted that way, uh, sometimes even uh, uh, crossing lines for an Israeli diplomat. Um, but uh, American Jews have to understand the Israel better in order to at least to understand why it happens and, and, and to influence. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into uh, um, American domestic policy, uh, uh, but take, for instance, the Second Amendment. Um, Israelis, most Israelis, don't understand the Second Amendment. Um, why it's a sacred right to bear arms. Um, but if you come to this country, and uh, learn uh, the history and uh, how the, the positions were shaped of different uh, groups in America, at least you understand. You not necessarily agree, but you understand it. You also understand what it takes to change that. Um, the same thing is in Israel regarding uh, 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 there are legacies and political structures and political realities and demographic realities uh, that if you want to influence Israel, it's not about the cutting ties, it's the opposite. It's about furthering the ties, uh, strengthening the ties, and understanding the processes. You know, that's the reason I, 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 I many times said, uh, again, sometimes crossing a line as an Israeli diplomat of what I should do and I should not do. I, I many times said to American leaders, Jewish leaders, um, they, they talked me up with me about the reverse uh, birthright. And I said, look, reverse birthright, I don't think you can do an in an mass reverse birthright. It doesn't make sense in my view. I would, I would do a reverse APAC. I would establish a kind of Amer Jewish American embassy or Jewish American political action center in Israel that will educate us about American Jewry, um, do PR, uh, and lobby for causes that are important to American Jewry um, with a robust, uh, significant, and, uh, and, 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 and Present, uninterrupted presence. I mean, not just, you know, people come and go. An embassy. Uh, then uh, one of the reactions I got is, yeah, but what is the, the, the what do you mean to advocate for the, for the uh, positions of American Jews? What are the positions? There are also Orthodox Jews and ultra-Orthodox Jews. Well, that's something that you will have to, to solve uh, uh, among yourselves. But yes, I think that the, uh, we, we have, uh, we have we have to do much better, and I said uh, publicly in Israel in Hebrew not long ago something that again uh, a, a diplomat that is not a political appointee probably wouldn't be able to say. I say the fact that uh, Israeli ministers uh, don't come to reform and conservative synagogues when they visit this country is very problematic. Very problematic. Mm -hmm. So. As you're about to end this four-year service, um, what would you say now impresses you most about American Jewry? The problems aside, what a, again, I said to you, I want to know your sense of what the strength of American Jewry is. There are many people, Danny, who worry that assimilation is the biggest problem, much more than BDS and much more than anti-Semitism, and that well, they just worry Jews are going to assimilate to the point of disappearing in another generation or so. But as you've experienced American Jewry over these four years, what impresses you most? What gives you the most hope? Okay, I will start uh, as a good Jew with the, with the down, downside. Uh, I think what worries me most, you mentioned assimilation, is related to that, but I think that what worries me most is the crisis of Jewish education in this country. 
Uh, I am the product, I don't know if I am a good product or a bad product, but I am the product of two things mainly. My family, a staunch Zionist family, a non-observant, but not particularly observant, but staunch Jewish and Zionist, and the amazing uh, uh, Jewish education network that existed in my native Buenos Aires when I was a child that was incomparable to any other in the world. And the crisis of Jewish education, the cost of Jewish education in this country, I think, is something that uh, uh, is the most critical issue that the American Jewish community faces. Look, um, I found here an extremely strong, robust uh, uh, Jewish, Jewish community, I mean, uh, connected to its Judaism with a vibrant uh, 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 cultural life and, 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 and social life and, and, and uh, religious life and everything. I think that the most amazing thing is uh, uh, um, the incredible communal structure that American Jewry built uh, uh, with uh, more than 100 years of work and dedication and also a lot of uh, money uh, that basically, if you want to be Jewish, it embraces you from cradle to grave and everything in between. I uh, think it's really amazing. No other ethnic community or religious community in this country has something that is comparable to that, that is even close to that. And I hope that the, that the crisis that we are facing now will not uh, jeopardize the existence of that uh, incredible structure that the Jewish community built uh, from coast to coast. I want one piece of advice from you. For sure. What is your advice to American Jews who, again, they are very pro-Israel? but they look at an Israeli policy, whether it's settlement policy or occupation policy or policy having to do with the Orthodox rabbinate and, or the political system and the, the parliamentary system that has all of these parties and in, every government has to be a coalition government and small parties end up with a disproportionate amount of power because they're necessary to prop up whatever coalition government exists, whatever the criticisms are, what criticisms of Israel are appropriate for American Jews to voice in public? Are there any criticisms of Israel that you would say are inappropriate for American Jews to express in public? Well, it's, a, it's a really tough question. I, I mentioned things that I think should be out of the scope in, 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 in calling to action, not only in criticism, like uh, cutting aid to, to Israel's security or boycotting Israel. But uh, uh, look, I, I, I think that uh, uh, American Jews should be careful to criticize Israel on matters that uh, are related to, to the life of Israelis. I'm not saying they can't do it. Uh, you know, it, it's also not, in, not realistic to say in, in, in the 21st century, don't tweet about it. Uh, uh, everyone uh, speaks uh, freely and, and that's good. That's a good thing. But I would say uh, probably as a final remark, Mark, is that, uh, you know, when you have sometimes, you are, and sometimes you are angry or even exasperated about this or that in Israel, Zoom out. Zoom out to the last 2,000 years of Jewish history. And look uh, where we were and where we are. How much we suffered and how much uh, now we uh, thrive. And, uh, you know, when you look at the entire film, at not, last at the, not just at the last frames of the film, you understand what miraculous thing is the state of Israel and how lucky we are that we live in the generation that has an independent Jewish state that gives you reasons to criticize it. We have been so lucky to have you, Danny Dayan, 
as a consul general here in the United States on so many, many levels. By the way, I should also mention one of the things you brought to America was a gorgeous daughter who is also very bright, wonderful, articulate, fabulous. And you know, it never happens by accident. Mm -hmm. So that your daughter reflects very well upon you and your entire family, you and yeah, your wife. Exactly. That's what I intended to say, that my wife and I deserves at least 50% of the credit. At least. Anyway, everything about you has been so wonderful. What are you going to do next, Danny Dayan? The only concrete thing I know is for sure is that starting August 2nd, I will quarantine for 14 days. I will be in quarantine for 14 days and then we will see. I have some ideas. I will say that, I can say that, you know, I, I, I return here in some sense as a different person in the sense that I understood uh, the importance of this bond between Israel and an American jury and that uh, not enough people in Israel, not enough persons in Israel are committed to that and uh, I intend to, in, in, in some way to, to remain involved in that. Yotse Minakal, you are out of this world. When you retire from this job at the end of July, know that you've done marvelous work for the Jewish people and for the service of the State of Israel and you are so much of what we want not simply diplomats to be, what we want Jews to be, what we want people to be. You are, you are a lovely, lovely mensch. And as people can see in this hour together, you are thoughtful and you're sensitive and you're lovely. And I've loved getting to know you. I will miss you, but I know you and I will continue to have a relationship no matter where. For sure. Call two v'hatzlecha. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Be well. The thoughts of Israeli Consul General Denny Dayan, who at the end of July is completing four years of service for the State of Israel at the New York Consulate. A remarkable person, not only a you know, quality diplomat, who really became beloved everywhere he went in America, but he also is just a lovely, lovely human being. I'm I hope you've enjoyed meeting him once again on L'Chaim. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me at rabbigalab at jbstv.org or you can write me at Post Office Box 360, Stanford, Connecticut, 06904. And remember, you can now take L'Chaim with you anywhere you go as a L'chaim podcast. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well and stay safe. L'chaim, my friends, to life. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.